join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. John Trumbull. Thank you very much. That's, uh, I wish my students would applaud when I came in the room. <laughs> That's quite different. What I want to talk about today is probably a little different from what you've heard in the past. Uh, I would like to talk about the effects of climate change, particularly on insects, but also on the world's food supply. And I'll start with the effect of elevated atmospheric CO2 on uh, the insects, then effects of increasing temperatures, and changing rainfall patterns. All of these can be expected to have some fairly dramatic outcomes. Specifically, uh, we'll see increases in insect feeding, uh, new medical problems, and probably a changes, some changes in the way plants and types of plants that are grown in California. Ultimately, these are going to lead to changes in food availability, diversity losses, and these are already showing up. Some big studies in Germany and in England have shown dramatic decreases in insect populations. Not sure we can entirely put that on climate change yet, but clearly there's a lot going on. Uh, we're going to see water shortages. We're seeing those already in California. And I put in possible conflict. Uh, we can take out the word possible now. It's already changing. I wanted to put this slide in. It's from 2008. Uh, this is the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere over here. This is from 2008. And I put it in to remind myself just how fast things are changing. Uh, there are more recent slides, but this really makes a good point. In 2008, there were about 380 parts per million of CO2. Now, 10 years later, it's 405. And in Mauna Loa this August, they recorded an entire month at 411 parts per million. It's going up at a rather dramatic rate. If you look at the emissions, the lower emissions scenario, this is for a combination of a lot of the models that have been built. They suggest that it'll be about 550. That was in 2008. Now they're talking about 650. At the upper level, if things go really bad, they were estimating it would be about 900 parts per million. That is now up above 1,250 parts per million. Things are changing much faster than we ever expected. And in fact, when I first started in, in climate change studies back in 1980, uh, I told my students, you may, at the end of your professional career, start to see real changes are happening. And here they're happening. Uh, before the end of my career, which is was quite remarkable because I didn't think my career would last this long either. <laughs> so let's start with CO2. First of all, CO2, uh, when it increases in the atmosphere, it increases photosynthetic activity. These are some bean plants that we studied back in the mid-80s. This is ambient CO2 in the blue, so that's about, at that time, uh, about 380. Here's elevated CO2 that we put into the system to match what was suspected to be in 2050 or 2100. And you can see photosynthesis increases in elevated CO2. That's really great. And in fact, the plants grow much faster. This is ambient. This is with elevated CO2. Everything else is held the same in these studies. And we found that uh, they grow really much bigger and much faster than they did. This led a guy named Lamarch in 1984 to write a science article saying, this is going to be wonderful. It's going to be a panacea for the world's food supply. We're going to get this huge increase in agricultural productivity, and will help us to feed the world. Right now, the estimates are we need to double our food supply by 2050. Uh, if that's the case, this could go a long way toward that. The problem is, Lamarch was not aware of the insect factor in this. We did a series of studies with a cabbage looper, a very common a uh, caterpillar that feeds on all sorts of crops, including beans. And the consumption per larvae in ambient was here, but in elevated CO2 increased by 20%. And if we look at the nitrogen in the plant, in ambient, they have pretty high levels of nitrogen. And there's about a 25% reduction in elevated CO2. The plants are growing so rapidly, they can't pick up enough nitrogen under normal circumstances to be able to meet all of their needs much less the needs of, say, a genetically engineered plant where they've got additional proteins that they want the, the plant to produce. But our first thought uh, when we saw this 
if the larval consumption is going up with increased CO2, if we put a stomach poison out there or a pathogen out there and they eat more of it, will they get intoxicated faster? And the answer was, yeah, it works a lot better. We used uh, foliar applied Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a bacterium that has no uh, known effect on humans or minimal effect on humans, but it's, it can be quite damaging to a caterpillar population. And in fact, they worked a lot better. When we tried this on genetically engineered plants, it worked much worse. And in fact, it really dropped the amount of protein that was occurring in the plant because the plant's stressed for nitrogen because it's growing so fast. And it selectively puts the nitrogen into its own needs for growth and development before it put it into the uh, protein production. They've now since changed that and made the plant, and they've forced the plant to produce these very high levels of protein, even at the uh, reduction in growth from less nitrogen. The grower's response has been, let's put more nitrogen on. And this causes all sorts of interesting problems with the nitrogen runoff. They've seen this at the Chesapeake Bay, for example. Uh, they had terrible problems with nitrogen runoff, and they made a real effort to reduce that, and the bay is coming back. California is also out in front. We have uh, laws in place now to reduce nitrogen runoff from farms. and They're really beginning to have the type of impact that we want. But the problem is still there. If you want your plants to grow faster under elevated CO2, you put on more nitrogen. Well, this affects plant quality. This is a study by Lowell Days in 2014. He looked at about 130 different plant species grown in elevated CO2, and he found that all of these elements dropped, including nitrogen. The only thing that increased was carbon. CO2 from uh, the atmosphere is a great addition of carbon, and so they did fine. But everything else dropped. And in fact, they suggested in this paper that the quality of the nutrition for humans was also dropping because they were putting up a lot less of the elements that we need for, for growth and development. Well, this led me to think about the cascading effects that are going on here. You start with these host suitability changes where you're reducing the quality of the plant. That means that the insects have to eat more material in order to get the nitrogen that they need. Insects are based on nitrogen and protein, like us. They've got to have the nitrogen to make the proteins for growth and development. The plant's carbon-based. So it doesn't really need quite as much. But if you reduce it in the plant, then the insect has to eat more. And then despite this faster growth, when we started measuring the yields following insect feeding, we find that yields declined dramatically, even though the plants were growing faster. And this is something that Lamarch didn't think about at the time that he wrote his paper either. So now you've got a situation where yields are in decline. And this interestingly enough, led us to do some studies and a number of other people to do some studies to find out that the change in quality in the plants was affecting the nutritional status of the insect, which was affecting the nutritional status of the parasites that we used to control the insect. Now our parasites are not as effective as they used to be at controlling the insect populations. They can't grow and develop as quickly because the quality of their host has been reduced. I put together a little summary, and we'll just cover this very quickly. This is increasing atmospheric CO2, and it leads to increasing food consumption by caterpillars. Oddly enough, you get a reproduction increase in aphids. The nitrogen that the plant does have ends up in the phloem, which is the part of the system that the aphids feed on, so they do a little better. It increased predation by a lady beetle, and we thought, this is really unusual. Why would that be going up? Well, we found out that aphids produce alarm pheromones and this was not me, this was other folks that found this. Aphids produce alarm pheromones and the decrease in elevated CO2. And because of that, the aphids are not jumping off the plant and running away from the predators, so the predators are getting more to eat. Uh, carbon-based plant defenses will increase because you've got all this additional carbon. And you know, the foliar applications of compounds like Bacillus thuringiensis are more effective uh, because the insects are eating more, they get intoxicated more quickly. If you look at decreasing, developmental rates tend to slow down. Parasitism is a real problem for us because we use parasites in California very heavily in our insect control programs. And the effects of parasitism are declining. Effects of transgenic bacillus thuringiensis declined rather spectacularly. 
they've now attached the, the mechanism for growth of the proteins that are used for Bacillus thuringiensis that are engineered into the plants into a system where the plant has to produce it. Uh, but probably more important, nitrogen-based plant defenses, which are the ones that are most effective on insects, have actually started to decline. Well, that brings us to temperature, and we'll try and pull all these together at the end. But this is a study from the Hadley Center in the, in the UK, and it's probably one of the more accurate ones based on the results that we've seen so far. Uh, basically, we're, in the US, we're looking at about three to five degrees centigrade change if we don't do something by 2100 or 2070. So it's a pretty big change, but you'll note that the Arctic and up into Canada, they're seeing some very substantial changes. And these are happening in Brazil, Saharan Africa, and even Sub-Saharan Africa, India. These are going up dramatically in terms of temperature, and that's gonna have a huge impact on the world's food supply. Uh, people that are a lot smarter than I am have suggested that we're gonna see a 20 to 50% decrease in food production in Africa and Asia. That is really scary. Uh, my own studies of how plants compensate for insect attack have found that if you increase the temperature, you can reduce the compensation ability of the plant for insect damage. Turns out we use insect, we use plant compensation rather substantially to help us maintain our productivity even if there's some insect damage out there. We're losing that ability at this point. Uh, we're also going to see changes in rainfall patterns. These are happening. And storm patterns. And people would argue now that we're seeing bigger storms and wetter storms than we have in the past. That's really outside of my area, so I'll leave that to others. But uh, it is one of the things that's been suggested. These increasing temperatures are going to lead to several important factors. First of all, we're going to have more invasive species, and I'm talking about insect species. This is one that uh, I've studied extensively. It's a, a potato beetle, uh, sorry, a potato psyllid. It attacks the plant and it introduces a, a pathogen, a bacteria-like pathogen, that instead of the potato tuber putting up starch, and when you fry the starch, it turns this nice clear golden color, it puts up sugar, and the sugar caramelizes, and so your potato chips look like this. I thought this was gonna be the marketing strategy of the century. This was gonna be wonderful. You know, we were gonna sell these as zebra chip potatoes. They were gonna be great. It turns out that that caramelized burnt sugar flavor uh, makes the consumer send this right back. And uh, Frito-Lay said they had a whole bunch of these returned. Well, this insect has been around for a long time. It was in California and in Texas, every 25 years it would show up for a year, for six months in California, and then disappear. Now it's present permanently in California. I could go to Ventura and collect these tomorrow. And they have stable populations that are as far north now as Idaho. Uh, they have populations that are beginning to show up in greenhouses in Canada and cause real damage up there to their tomato operations. This is a leaf binding fly. When I first arrived in California, this is the first insect I worked on. This one has been displaced entirely by another species, which has since been displaced by another species. We're in our third species of leaf miner. They all look exactly like that, but uh, they have slightly different effects, and they have greatly different resistance to pesticides. And so it's been, a, it's been a real challenge for us. But that's happening because the temperatures have gone up in California by about two degrees Fahrenheit. And that's enough to allow these things to develop at a much faster rate and survive where they couldn't before. We're also getting lots of new insect species like the Bagrata bug and some others. Uh, these are partly because the climate is now acceptable to them, but it's also largely because, I think, uh, there's so much more traffic, so much more movement of people and goods that we're bringing insects from all over the place. The problem is that now the climate is such where they can, they can survive. It also increases the potential for some pest outbreaks. These, all of this red in this area is, are, are pine trees that have been killed by bark beetles. Under a normal drought circumstance, the trees don't have very much water. 
they need water. They need a lot of water to, to fight off these insects. These insects burrow into the tree in large numbers. They feed in the vascular system of the tree, clog it up, the tree dies, and then you have these standing dead trees. If you have lots of water, they can produce tremendous amounts of sap, and they'll actually push the beetles out. Well, we've been in a drought circumstance in the west coast of the United States for quite some time now. Uh, for the last 10 years at least, we've seen some very high levels of drought. And we have vast areas where we've lost these trees. And that results in massive fires. And that's what we've been seeing all over California and all over the West Coast. Those standing dead trees are an amazing source of fuel for, for a fire. On top of that, when you have a drought, you end up in increasing temperatures when they occur together you actually cause significant problems for locusts. Locusts typically are uh, a green form that is uh, not likely to interact with other locusts. They stay pretty far apart. And it's only when they get together that there's these hormonal changes that turn them into a, a brown or a, a red shade of color. And they change from these very solitary ones to these very gregarious ones that develop in huge numbers. This last two years, we've had major outbreaks of locusts in China, in Russia, in uh, the Middle East, and in Sub-Saharan Africa. It got so bad in China, uh, I was there a few years back, that the people were collecting these. Some people said they were just eating them. I didn't see very much of that. But they were collecting bags of them, blanching them, drying them out, grinding them up, and making them into a kind of a protein powder that they could add to their other food so that they were getting more protein. So there may be some good would come of that, but the damage that they do when they feed on the crops is, is simply spectacular. Well, there are about a billion different models out there. This is about the only one that I really like. Uh, it seems like it's working pretty well. It was made by a guy named Diefenbaugh, whom I don't know. But this is an ensemble model. Basically, you've got temperature and rainfall. So as you move up the spectrum this way, it's drier and it's hotter. Look at Southern California. We're looking at some pretty serious situations that might develop. This is, we are precisely on track for this model to be accurate. Uh, I'm kind of a show me person when it comes to modeling. I'm, I'm a practical field guy for the most part. And I get out in the field and when you start seeing stuff in the field, uh, that matches the models, it begins to tell you that maybe there's something there. And as, as disturbing as that is, this is the part that really worries me. Mexico produces a simply vast amount of our vegetables. And the area where they produce it is right in here. Uh, from Sinaloa all the way over to the, the middle of the country. If we lose that production for U.S. consumption and it goes the what's left goes to consumption in Mexico, we're going to have to replace a really big chunk of food. And that's going to be very an interest, a very interesting process for us. It got so bad that the New York Times reported uh, that in Merced, they were using dowsers to try and find water underground. And that they were going through and they were drilling at these spots that the dowsers found. And by last year, they had removed so much water from underground in the San Joaquin Valley, that the ground was subsiding, and some of the large aquifers, which bring the water from the north all the way down to us, they were actually cracking and spilling water because the ground had subsided beneath them from all of the groundwater that had been taken out. So what's the insect going to do? Well, one thing it can do is evolve, and there's all sorts of genetic information where this is, is going on. I like this particular one where it talks about changing thermal tolerances. Back in uh, 2008 and then again in 2017, they repeated studies that were done in the 1960s, where they looked at, in this particular case, it's Colorado potato beetle, which was devastating potatoes all throughout the Northeast and into the central part of the country. And they found that in that time frame, since 1960s, these insects have developed a thermal tolerance that allows them to tolerate two to three degrees temperatures higher than they could back then. So there's clearly some, some action going on there with evolution. And we're also seeing this in the timing of egg hatch. And there are a whole bunch of examples, but I like this particular one with a birch moth 
It's a caterpillar that feeds on birch trees, mostly in the southern part of Canada. These caterpillars' eggs are what overwinter. The female lays some eggs, they overwinter, and when the photo period is right, they hatch, they come out, and they need to be timed so that they're feeding on the new young tissues that come out, because these small caterpillars have very small mouths, and they have to be able to chew this stuff up. The problem is the trees were keying on temperature, and so they were coming out much earlier, and by the time the caterpillars' eggs hatched, and they came out as caterpillars, it was too late. The plants were too tough for them to eat. And we lost generations of the birch moth. It's only more recently that they've begun to come back, and they're beginning to appear uh, in large numbers again. They have changed from only using photoperiod to using a combination of photoperiod and temperature for their egg hatch. So there are changes going on. Probably more common, and what you'll see more likely, uh, is that they move. Uh, there are lots and lots of examples of how they can move. The one that most people point to is the Edith's checker spot. A woman named Parmesan from Texas looked at these and found that their populations had moved about 200 kilometers north of, of their furthest north point uh, that they existed before. And in the south, they had moved north by about 200 kilometers. So they were now moving out of Mexico, and they were almost to Canada. And they, this whole process was, uh, was accelerating. I did look, when I was studying this, I looked back through uh, some previous research, and there was a really good study out of Australia where they looked at bark beetles and the bark beetle movements with temperature. And they found that over almost geologic time, uh, thousands of years, the bark beetles moved up, the, uh, up to the top of Australia and then back down. We're seeing this in just a couple of decades. It's really quite, quite strikingly different. One of the big things that you see on the news all the time are the glaciers are receding. This is the Uppsala Glacier, the largest glacier in South America. Taken in 1928, same picture at the same time of year, from the same location. This is 2004. You can see how far back it's retreated. Well, that's very interesting, but what happens with the insects in this is that the plants move in and the insects follow them. This allows the insects to start moving through passes uh, and places that they could never get through before. And there's a perfect example with the mountain pine beetle. This is some work that was done by Logan and Powell in 2001 and 2005. In 1994, the mountain pine beetle extended its range into the interior of British Columbia. Temperatures rose there by 1.9 degrees centigrade. That's one of those areas where temperature's really going up fast. Well, when the temperature rose, these things went north with the increased temperature, and they got pretty far north, up into British Columbia, over halfway through, and they were held in check by very cold winter temperatures. If it got to minus 45, which seems awfully cold to me, if it got to minus 45 for three weeks, it would kill the larvae in the trees, and the population would die back, and they couldn't move any further. In 1999, they stopped getting those very cold temperatures in the winter. These things moved further north, and in 2002, it crossed the Rockies at Pine Pass. Up until this point, they'd been mostly on the western side of the Rockies. Where they were on the eastern side, it was up against the Great Plains, and there are no trees for them to move on, so they were stuck. But in 2002, they crossed through the Pine Pass. And by 2004, they had about 20,000 spot populations. There was a time when it was in 2002 when they thought they'd be able to go in and eradicate this because the losses were huge. Uh, the Canadians uh, were estimating that the, on a yearly basis, they were using three, they were losing three trillion cubic meters of wood a year. That's just spectacular. And by, unfortunately, by 2004, it had spread so much. The spot infestation would be something of greater than 20 trees being affected. Uh, it was way too big for them to consider eradication. This is going to lead to some really interesting results, and it's something that a lot of entomologists are watching. We start with the, the pattern here. This, this pale blue is really the color of where it was. It spread up all the way up to Pine Pass, crossed over Pine Pass, and got on the east side of the Rockies. The problem is that on the east side of the Rockies, these lodgepole pine, which are a good host, 
interface with a pine called the jack pine. Here and here, and it's already happening. They've already moved down. So now they can move south to increasing temperatures uh, in the south and then into the jack pine. And we're predicting they're going to move all the way across the continent. We don't know how fast this would happen. I would have told you in the past it will take them a couple hundred years or maybe a hundred years. I, I've given up on that. Things happen much faster than you expect. But the problem for us is that it, it interfaces with the eastern white pine. Eastern white pine is really an important uh, tree for a lot of the forests in that area, but perhaps more importantly to the homeowners, an individual white pine tree that's mature on your property in the Northeast could be worth $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 to you as a homeowner. And so they become very expensive in this region. The beetles will be able to move all the way down, and the real fear is that they're going to hit the loblolly pine down here. This is where so many of the big timber companies produce pine for paper. And they can, it grows really fast, and they can produce a lot of it. But if it gets down here, they estimate that the losses are likely to be in the billions of dollars. Well, one of the things that really caught my eye was in terms of temperature changes were the USDA cold hardiness zone maps. These are what the USDA produces, and the nurseries use these to decide what plants they should put in their nurseries that will grow well in their given area. It's a, it's a pretty nice arrangement. And they have all these different zones. But if you look at, say, zone three in 1990, look how it's changed 25 years later. Uh, it's, it's almost disappeared. If you go to, uh, say, Georgia and South Carolina, and you have, uh, here you have about half of it is zone seven and half of it is zone eight. Over here, it's all zone eight and zone nine is creeping in. This is in 25 years. Uh, this, is, uh, this is quite a remarkable change. What that's gonna mean is we're gonna have a whole bunch of new plants that didn't used to grow here that are not only gonna grow here, but Nurseries are going to import them and we'll be planting them. That's going to have an impact on the insects. And we've predicted, and a number of people have predicted, uh, I think Dukes and Mooney were the first to suggest this, was that if you have insects that are generalists, they eat multiple species, maybe multiple families of plants, they're going to do much better than the specialist herbivores. The specialists are going to be constrained by what's available. Uh, at that particular location. But if you're bringing in lots of new species, some of those are going to provide additional hosts for the generalists. And the generalists are going to become uh, very important. One of the changes that we're seeing already is that insect responses to plant path or to insect pathogens are changing. This is a P aphid, very common insect pest in the UK, in Britain. They have had this for hundreds of years, uh, and they've recorded you know, the populations. And up until about 2000 or 1995, the rains would start in Britain, the humidity would go up, and a fungal disease would develop naturally and just wipe out the P. aphid. They never had to do anything about it. Now, since about 1995, they're finding that the P. aphids aren't dying. There's not enough rain. The humidity is not as high. These things are surviving, and now they have to put pesticides on. So it's been a, a significant change there. And we use some fungi in California as well, but not so much in Southern California because we're already pretty dry. So these increasing temperatures are gonna benefit those species that have multiple generations. Multivoltine is multiple generations. It used to be when I started in 1980, we had a beet armyworm that fed on celery. And I worked here in Orange County on that for many years. And we typically had two and a half to three generations a year. Each generation bigger than the last one because you've got all these new females producing lots of eggs and they develop really quickly and then the, the lack of food drops the population way back. Now they're at four to five generations per year. The populations can get really large uh, in a, just a single summer. I wanted to bring up the special case for mosquitoes because this is something we're all going to be dealing with in Southern California in a way we haven't really had to deal with before. First of all, their geographic distributions are changing. A lot of this is because of transport. Uh, maybe five or six years ago, we had 
the Asian tiger mosquito move into LA. I, I was told it came in on this lucky bamboo shoots from China. That particular species can deliver dengue, malaria, chikungunya, Zika. It's, it's a, a really an artist at delivering pathogens to humans, and it's very aggressive. And we're seeing them spread throughout the country. And there are places where they're showing up where they never would have been able to survive before because of just the temperature. But more importantly, the disease ranges are changing. It used to be that if you were worried about dengue, you didn't have to worry about it if you were in the United States, at least not very much, because it requires a temperature of about 16 degrees centigrade to complete its life cycle in the insect. What happens is the insect goes, the mosquito goes out, it feeds on a human that's got dinghy, picks it up, that cycles through the insect, ends up in its salivary glands, and then it shoots it into the next human that it attacks. This is a problem if the temperatures are around 16 degrees or higher because then it can complete the development in the salivary glands. Up until now, we've not had that problem. But I just looked at a, a, the pattern of dinghy expansion in the United States. And there was a study that was done in 1996, and they studied the previous 16 or 18 years of dinghy occurrence in uh, Texas. And they suggested there were about 43 cases that were probably uh, actually transmitted within Texas. Now, in 1999, there were 111, and now it's, it's astronomical. They're getting lots. And dinghy is a, a most unpleasant disease. I've seen this in a hospital in Thailand. Uh, I know it occurs in Mexico at pretty high levels, but it's, it's called breakbone fever. It causes all of your muscles to contract at the same time, and, the, and you just can't do anything. And it's extremely painful, and uh, I haven't had it, but I, I can say it's very unpleasant to look at. When that sort of thing starts happening here, and it's already happening in, in Texas and in Florida, when that starts happening here, there's going to be a huge outcry for mosquito control. We are ahead of the game in some ways because California has mosquito abatement districts. and These are really useful. Uh, they help control the mosquito populations. They monitor for these major diseases that we have coming through that mosquitoes can transmit. Our taxes pay for those, but uh, from my point of view, we're, we're saving ourselves a lot of grief by having those folks uh, control the mosquito populations coming out of backyard swimming pools that have been abandoned and that sort of thing. They really do a pretty good job. But there's more to the story. When you raise the mosquito in higher temperature, the females are smaller. Smaller insects need to feed more often to produce, uh, to get the protein they need to mature their eggs. And the more often you feed, the better chance for disease transmission. The first time they feed, they may pick it up from a human that's infected. The next time they feed is when they can actually transmit it. And if you're small and you have to feed lots of times, you increase the transmission. And their populations are expanding. One of the things that I got entirely wrong when I was thinking about this, uh, even just a few years back, was the West Nile virus. I thought if we had droughts, it would decrease West Nile virus, which is a, a virus that had entered in about 1999 into the Northeast. And by 2002, it had spread completely across the country. Birds fly, and they migrate, and they carry the pathogen. Uh, what was happening here with the drought is that you had big ponds that became relatively small-sized ponds, and everything else dried up. Mosquitoes have to have water in order to lay their eggs. And so they go to the water to lay their eggs, and that's the only water available for horses and for birds. And when the birds come there, they're there with the mosquitoes. If they have the West Nile virus, it gets transmitted, and they die. We lost, I don't know how many thousands of crows in Southern California. At my house, we used to see about 800 to 1,000 fly by every evening, uh, coming from the places that they fed out in the desert to their rookeries uh, at the Santa Ana River. That went down to zero. We were finding dead crows in our yard. We lost lots of other species of, of, of bird as well. And it's because the droughts were forcing the, the mosquitoes and the birds into close proximity. The other problem is it was beginning to expose horses because West Nile is also dangerous for horses. And there are a number of other uh, types of 
viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes, uh, Western equine encephalitis, St. Louis encephalitis. These are also impacted by the same drought effect. and They are really toxic to horses. And so our mosquito abatement districts put out these chicken flocks and they periodically take some blood from them and the chickens will produce antibodies if that particular virus is present. It doesn't hurt the chicken, but you know if it's present and then they up their efforts to try and control these things. So what's happening around the rest of the world? Well, one of the most interesting places that, that we should watch uh, from our viewpoint here is East Africa, particularly around Kenya. All of the models that I've seen suggest that they're going to get increased rainfall. Virtually everywhere else in sub-Saharan Africa, the rainfall is going to decline. But in the eastern part near Kenya, it's going to go up. And in fact, the Kenyan Ministry of Environment said it's going to undermine their economy, that they were worried about uh, the change in agriculture that their people weren't ready to make and the, and the change in the, uh, the way crops could be planted. I looked at this and I said, you're going to have conflict because people are going to move from sub-Saharan Africa where there's no water and their, their crops are dying, their animals are dying. They're going to move to where the water is. And I, I was... I wrote this in a paper in 2009, and I was thinking, yeah, maybe by 2050, we're going to start seeing these problems. 2011, Kenya reported they had running battles going on as people were moving in in large numbers and fighting with the locals trying to take over the land. So it's already started. If you look at Brazil, global warming uh, is suggested that it's going to change Brazil rather dramatically. Do you remember that Hadley that map that I showed at the beginning? Brazil had a big chunk of 5 to 10 degrees centigrade change, and they were suggesting by the end of 2020, their major food crops, rice, coffee, beans, cassava, maize, and soybeans, would reduce in value by up to about 4 billion. I haven't seen a lot of that yet. It turns out that humans are pretty resilient. They will plant different cultivars that are a little bit more drought tolerant. They will find some way to get water to the plants, but the costs are going to be there. Their costs are going up, and so it's going to be very interesting to watch and see how bad that gets by the end of 2020. This is the global population density projected, what, six years out, seven years out? This is pretty close to happening. The red color tells you how many persons per square kilometer, okay? You look at some of these areas up in the, the continent across from Britain. If you look at India, Asia, portions of sub-Saharan Africa, they're going over 120 people per square kilometer. That's an astounding concentration of people. And there was a really interesting study that was done by a group of UK scientists working with Chinese scientists, and they came out with this prediction it said, just as a result of what they expect from climate change in these areas, given these massive populations that are developing, that China is likely to see a reduction in yields in their key crops, and as the population increases, they're going to fall short of what's needed for their own people. Now, the Chinese take the long view, and if you've watched them over the last 15 years, they have been buying up vast areas of Africa and they're producing crops in these regions, and they're shipping them to China already. Uh, this is going to end up causing problems in the future, but right now it's a pretty far-sighted strategy. So this led me to some simple predictions of conflict and cooperation. Uh, if you look at reduction in food productivity, that's going to cause migrations, and there are going to be conflicts over cropland. And as I said, I thought it would be 2050, uh, UN reported this in 2010 and 2011 in Kenya. I think it will result in us considering nationalizing food supplies. This is a very dangerous path to go down. England has talked about this because they didn't think the rest of the EU, with their very high population density, was going to be able to produce enough for themselves, much less enough for the, the rest of England as well as part of the system. So they talked about it, but they didn't take any action. India took action. They uh, restricted the movement of basmati rice strains out of uh, India, and they limited onions. Onions are an absolutely critical 
staple for the vast majority of the population in India. They're very important. They're highly nutritious. Uh, they're, they're, very, they're very good. But the farmers were making more money if they shipped them out of India and sold them to other people. And that put the Indian government at some danger because it reduced the food supply that was available. So they actually did nationalize a few of them. China has been talking about it. I've just heard a few of my colleagues mention this in the US. I, I haven't seen any evidence that there's a, a really significant effort to try and nationalize the food supply. But the UN is really concerned about it. The UN's Food and Agricultural Organization really wants people not to nationalize their food supplies because they've discovered that if you do that, you can't get an international response to famines fast enough. The people, the, when the famine occurs, if you've got restrictions on what can be moved out of the country, you can't get those turned over in time to help the people in, in need. And increasing famines is something that is almost certainly going to result, particularly in Africa and I think also in Mexico and in South America, uh, from, the, from climate change. That brings us to the effects of drought, uh, the type that we've experienced here in Southern California and the type that uh, is occurring all in Sub-Saharan Africa and now in parts of uh, South America. Purple pipes are great. They use reclaimed water. So when you flush the toilet, when you take a shower, when you wash your dishes, that goes down the drain, goes back to these uh, water treatment plants. They do a very simple, uh, superficial type of cleanup, and with that, they then put them in the purple pipes, and that gets shipped out for agricultural use. And this will be sprayed onto crops or irrigating the, for irrigating the crops. It can also be sent to cities for use on parks. And uh, there's even some new um, housing developments that were built in California where purple pipes are used for the irrigation in the yards. It's a great idea. I talked to my Metropolitan Water District representative uh, when I started working on this, and he said their goal is to sell the water three times. And I, I can believe that they're trying to do it. But in the purple pipes seemed like a great idea. But it turns out purple pipes uh, and that reclaimed water contain PPCPs. These are pharmaceuticals and personal care products. Every birth control hormone that a woman takes and urinates out into the toilet goes right to these water treatment plants. Every pharmaceutical you can think of, caffeine. Uh, interestingly enough, Seattle has the highest level of caffeine in reclaimed water. <laughs> I, I'm not going to point at Starbucks or Seattle's best, but uh, those people like their coffee. Uh, but you know, you've got hormones, antibiotics, painkillers. Uh, for example, with a human hormone, the birth control hormone, when it goes to the water treatment plant, it's got a salt attached to it, and it's pretty much deactivated. It goes through the water treatment process, and when it leaves, the salt has been removed and it's reactivated. That's why we're seeing fish and uh, some insects and amphibians that ha are switching uh, genders or have multiple genders or, you know, hermaphroditic with evidence of both genders. It's causing really odd things to happen. We wanted to look at what was going on with the insects in particular, because at that point, very few people had even considered insects. They were interested in fish and amphibians. So we tried this, and we looked at what the, what the impact would be on insects. And we started with this cabbage looper, uh, one of our favorite lab insects. It's easy to work with, and tomatoes. And down here, you have all of the different treatments that we had. This is the control. And this is the mean mortality of these insects if they feed on the levels that we found in reclaimed water. And what we found was that acetaminophen didn't have much effect, although it did have an effect on honeybees. That's another story. Here's caffeine, not much of an impact. Uh, antibiotics, it had a significant impact. Hormones had a significant impact. The mixture of antibiotics and hormones had a tremendous impact. We thought, well, maybe this will help us reduce the the use of pesticides if we're getting some mileage out of this. The problem is, is that some of the levels were too high. Uh, the, the levels that are occurring in the plants are actually high enough to have an impact potentially on humans. But they were certainly having an impact on the plants. 
We started with the levels that you would find in a dairy waste, wastewater treatment plant, really high. I didn't want to run an experiment you know, really low and then have to do it again higher and then have to do it again higher to find out what the level was. I thought, let's just take the worst case. We did the levels that you find in dairy wastewater treatment ponds and it killed the plants. Okay, there was nothing there. Okay, we went back, we used the level that was reported in the purple pipes, killed the plants. We took it down to the level that's found in surface waters. These are lakes and streams. These are antibiotics found in lakes and streams. And this is what the plants look like. This is all chlorosis. These plants are stressed. So there's a real problem in the long run in using this for agriculture for certain plants. And we need to figure out which ones those are. And we need to figure out which plants get the most or put up the most in their marketable portions so that we don't feed those to humans and children in particular, because some of those are gonna be at levels that are considered active. There's a group in Israel that's done some excellent work on this with other compounds. They haven't used the same ones we've used, but they found that the levels were high enough that they were considered likely to be active against children. And so we need to, we need to pay attention to that, this idea of Reclaiming the water and reusing it, I think, is absolutely necessary. We don't have enough fresh water, but we also need to do some sampling to make sure that we're not putting out high levels of any of these compounds. This happens to be root mass here, uh, just to give you an idea of what it did to the tomato plants. This is total root mass here. These are all the different treatments. This is antibiotics, and antibiotics ended up cutting the plant size down by over half. Uh, this is this is a pretty substantial effect, and we need to be aware of it. The one good thing on the horizon is that if you put these out onto the soil, there are bacteria in the soil that will break them down. The bad news is they're called pseudo-persistent because we keep watering the plants. If you water them two or three times a week, you are continually putting this compound out there, and so the plants are continually picking it up. And a lot of the importance of our work is we showed that the plants really pick it up and that it's enough to have an impact on biological systems. We've done this now with five or six different groups of insects, including mosquitoes, and the, the results are pretty, pretty stable that it's damaging the insects, but it's also causing some additional environmental problems that were completely unexpected. So what are we going to do here? Well. This rapid insect development, because of higher temperatures and because they're eating more, will modify our control strategies that we use. We've spent decades in the 60s, 70s, and 80s figuring out thresholds for insects. You can have this many insects in this crop and you will not suffer any economic loss. That was a really hard thing to explain to a grower, that you could have some insects out there and not have any economic loss. We figured out all those numbers. But now the insects are coming in sooner. They're, they're developing more rapidly. The populations are entering new generations much faster than we ever expected. All of that has to change. And we don't have the people right now to do those types of studies. We're going to have major, major changes in pest complexes. The insects that come in because of environmental uh, change are going to be different than what we're accustomed to. And we're really kind of behind the eight ball on this one. If you look at Europe, they have the European Plant Protection Organization. I got invited out to Paris for a week. It was tough duty, but somebody had to do it. And basically what they did is they said, you've got these insects on tomatoes, and we think that they can survive here in Europe. We think that they're going to come here eventually. What do we do to control these when they arrive? They've set this up for almost every crop that they have and, and every insect that could come in. So when an when a insect comes in, their farmers know these are the pesticides you can use, these are the parasites you can release, these are the cultivars that help reduce the damage. They're set and ready to go. When that potato psyllid showed up in California, and in, in particularly in Texas this last time, and caused millions and millions of dollars worth of losses to potatoes, it took us two years to figure out what the problem was. And then it was three years after that before we had strategies in place that you could at least start with. Five years of crop loss is a long time for a grower. And uh, Frito-Lay was just getting close to kind of backing out of the process. But to their credit, they brought together lots of researchers and started the process. But had we done this the way 
the EPO did, we would have been in place and ready to go. And it's something I think that the US should consider doing. We can expect a rise in generalists. We can express, expect increases in multivoltine species. I mentioned the altered uh, responses to pathogens, particularly the fungi. And we're going to see major changes in how plants are resistant to insects. You can get that resistance back if you put more nitrogen on, but if you put more nitrogen on, you end up with runoff, and that's where the, the real crux of the problem is. California's doing a pretty good job of trying to figure it out, but we really need to have more people working on this kind of thing, or we're not going to be ready. We're going to need some new understanding of the ecological effects. For me, it was uh, West Nile virus increases with drought. I thought for sure it would decrease. And we're going to need to look at some potential new cropping systems. I was on a seminar topic meeting with, uh, what was it, the United Grape and Wine Growers. And there were three of us that got up there, and it was the biggest group I've ever talked to. They estimated 2,000 people in the audience. They were all very interested in climate change. But the guy who talked after me talked about the temperature requirements for each of the cultivars of wine. You got Chardonnay, you got Pinot Noir, Cabernet. Each one's a little different, and the temperatures are changing in Napa Valley. And some of these folks just went white as sheets because they were right on the edge of what was acceptable for Cabernets. That's all they'd produced for the last 100 years out of that farm. That's what they wanted to produce. That's what they knew how to produce. And this guy was telling them, in 10 years, when the temperature's gone up one more degree, you're going to be looking at you know, Chardonnays. And it was, uh, boy, that was, a, that was a shocker for him. So we need to develop more programs for medical pests. Uh, I've showed you the potential problems with mosquitoes. It's not limited to mosquitoes, but that's the next big one that's coming down the pike. We need to invest in education and agricultural scientists. We've got we to find new thresholds for these sustainable programs. We've got to train the next generation of farmers, scientists, and even down to the level of pest control strategists, the folks that find the termites in your house or talk to the growers about what pesticide should be sprayed. I had a group of 25 freshmen last fall. Uh, UCR has this program where they take established faculty, they stick them with 25 freshmen, and those folks stay with them for the next four to five years until they graduate. And we kind of help mentor them. We talk with them about what they want to do. Well, my first question for this group is always, what do you want to be when you grow up? Out of 25, I had two astronauts and 23 dentists or doctors almost all doctors and most of the surgeons, but they hadn't decided on their specialty yet. Uh, so we have to convince them that there are real opportunities in agriculture, in agricultural science, even at the level of pest control advisors out there. There are tremendous opportunities, and they are not making the kind of money there that they were, they were hoping to make as an engineer or as an astronaut. We're going to also have to plan ahead for water shortages because we really have those coming on. All of this has got to happen while universities are very busily scaling back their agricultural departments. We used to have a department of entomology, we had a department of nematology, departments of plant pathology, departments of soil science. Now you have departments of entomological, soil science, and plant sciences. Or it, it, they've just started lumping them all together. You start out with a group of 25 people, and you put two of them together, and you've got a department of 50, and they narrow it down to 20 or 25. And then they add another department to it and do the same thing. And you end up with fewer and fewer agricultural sciences. Eventually, when people get hungry, this is going to swing back. This pendulum will swing back. But in the meantime, we really ought to be training more people. There is also reduced funding for grants and support. A lot of my work is on pollution. Try and get a grant out of the EPA these days. Uh, there is no money to be found there. There are competing demands uh, for farmers, for, for industry, for cities, for the use of land and water. These are growing, and our populations are growing at the same time. We have some really spectacular challenges to face, and humans are always resilient, and something will come out of this that we can work with. 
But right now, the picture is not ideal, and I think we need to start planning ahead if we're going to try and deal with the problems that are coming. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.